morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's fifth meeting of 2017. Agenda item number one is a decision on whether to take items six and seven in private. Item six is a paper on future scrutiny of the Railway Policing Scotland Bill. And item seven is consideration of a discussion paper on our inquiry into the role and purpose of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. Um, and also, could I ask members if they're content to take uh, a future draft report of our inquiry um, for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal in private also, all subsequent draft reports. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you for that. Next item on the agenda is um, an affirmative instrument on the draft stop and search code of practice appointed day Scotland regulations 2017 and I welcome Michael Matheson cabinet secretary for justice Stephen Jones head of policing powers and Craig French director of legal services uh, at the Scottish government to the committee this morning. Remind members, officials are permitted to give evidence under this item, but may not participate in the formal debate on the instruments under item three of the agenda. Uh, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and ask the cabinet secretary if you would want to make an opening statement. Convener, thank you for your invitation to appear before the committee today to discuss the stop and search code of practice. Members will be aware that the Justice Subcommittee on Policing took evidence on the 26th of January from John Scott QC and others, uh, and the Subcommittee has already considered issues raised in written evidence. I thought it would be helpful if uh, today I made some brief opening remarks before taking questions. Stop and search is at the heart of the delicate balance that we need to strike between the need to protect people and keep them safe and the need to safeguard the rights of the individual. As such, I have been keen to achieve consensus on this issue. I've also been keen to ensure that any changes to stop and search are evidence-based and that we use legislation to effect change where necessary. I thank members of the committee, both at past and present uh, for their interest in this area and for their constructive engagement with me during the passage of the Criminal Justice Act. I was keen to continue that collaborative and evidence-based approach when revising the draft code after the public consultation. That's why I established the Stop and Search Advisory Group chaired by John Scott QC. And I'd like to place on record my sincere thanks to John Scott and the group for their significant contribution to this work. I would also like to recognise that Police Scotland has already made significant improvements to Stop and Search in advance of the code coming into force. Police Scotland has engaged willingly, positively and constructively with the advisory group and with the government in the production of this code. I know that John Scott and the group greatly appreciate this. It's important to note, convener, that there is consensus amongst advisory group members about all of the changes that have been made to the draft code as a result of the consultation responses. It's also important to know that the code uh, will be kept under regular review and will uh, make, we'll make any further changes to the code uh, or based on evidence. I've asked the advisory group to continue to play a role in helping the government to assess evidence after the code has been in force for 12 months, with an interim assessment after six months. If the evidence points to a need for any change in the code or changes to legislation, then this is something which we will consider in due course. In summary, convener, we have taken an evidence-based collaborative approach to drafting the code. The code gives us a sound framework to record and monitor how stop and search is being used and to gather further evidence. I will continue to work with the advisory group, key stakeholders and the committee to assess uh, and act on evidence as it emerges. And I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Okay, questions from the committee. Liam, John Finney, um, Stuart Stevenson. Very much, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I, we did, as you say, have a very useful session with John Scott and others in the, in the subcommittee um, a, a week or so ago. 
um, and I think it was uh, encouraging to hear the, the level of consensus there is around um, uh, where we've kind of got to, um, both from Police Scotland uh, as well as obviously from members of the, the advisory group. I suppose where there was one area of, of um, uh, dispute and disagreement amongst those we had evidence from was um, around the, the, the figures. I mean, I think I quoted um, the, the, the figures that I'm aware of in, in the public domain of a, a reduction um, in, in uh, stop and search as a whole of around 93.5% um, in, in, uh, in a very short space of time. 99.5% um, in terms of consensual stop and search, which you seem to back up um, the arguments uh, about this being uh, uh, a, a, a tactic inappropriately um, used. But those figures themselves were called into question. I wonder whether you have a view on whether or not the baseline figures for, for the use of stop and search generally and, and for unregulated stop and search um, were robust, um, and, and if they weren't, if, if there are figures that you're aware of that would give a, 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 a clearer picture, a more accurate picture of the change that we've seen in terms of the use of this tactic in, in, in the last year or so? I think it would be fair to say that the uh, historical figures were not robust, and HMICS in their report recognised that they were not robust. Uh, part of that is down to the recording methods of the previous legacy forces and a combination as to how some of that then followed into uh, Police Scotland as a, a single force. I think it would be fair to say now from the evidence that you received from ACC Williams last week is mm. that the, they have a much more robust system in place now for recording stop and search and how that's now collected at a national level and it's analysed at a national level. So I think the more up-to-date figures uh, in the uh, last year in particular are a more accurate reflection of stop and search being used by Police Scotland. But uh, there's no doubt from the, uh, uh, the report which HMICS conducted into um, uh, stop and search uh, data is that there were significant flaws in how that information was being collated uh, and handled. And I think what the code allows us to do is to make sure that we now move into a much better uh, place in having a, a clearer set of rules around the use of stop and search and how that should be recorded, uh, both at uh, an officer level and right through into how the service will then collect that data and publish it in an annual basis. And as you'll be aware, um, a, a requirement under the uh, Criminal Justice Act is that uh, uh, an annual uh, set of data has to be published and it also sets down the categories as well from age uh, through to gender, through to uh, national origin, um, all of which uh, have to be published now by Police Scotland on an annual basis. Well, what JCC Williams was, was saying last week, it appeared, was that um, officers and, 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 and parts of the force had, had almost got into a habit of, of using this tactic almost as a, as a first resort rather than a last resort, and that what had been witnessed over the, the last year or so was um, the deployment of, of other techniques, um, uh, so to speak, in, in, in um, ensuring that, that policing remains um, effective, but, but which, in a sense, leaves the, the stop and search option as, as effectively the, the last option, or where there is um, uh, a, a suspicion of, 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 um, uh, of, of something that, that would merit a search under regulated, uh, under regulated terms. I mean, is that, would that concur with your well, impression? What, what happened was there was, the, um, there was a piece of work carried out by uh, the Scottish Police Authority looking at the issue of stop and search. There was then a piece of follow-up work carried out by HMICS looking at the data collection around uh, stop and search. And one of the suggestions that was made by HMICS was that there should be a presumption against uh, the use of um, uh, consensual stop and search. Uh, and uh, Police Scotland have been operating in that basis um, since March 2015, uh, that they've no longer been using, uh, or they have been reducing the use of consensual uh, stop and search. Uh, and what has happened, I think, during the course of that time is that there has been a concerted effort on the part of Police Scotland to have more accurate recording of stop and search and also to see us phasing out of uh, consensual stop and search. 
Um, and uh, as a result of that, I think the data which we now have over the last year with the national unit they now have in Stop and Search is that we can be, uh, I think we can be more confident about that information. But what the code will specifically do, though, is it will actually set that framework in a much clearer fashion uh, so that there are no doubts about what has to be recorded, how it should be conducted, when it should be conducted, um, as well, and we'll place it all on a statutory uh, footing. So. I think part of the issues that you've raised, I think, uh, highlights some of the, uh, I think at times, uh, some of the uncertainty around the way in which stop and search has been used and the, uh, uh, the various approaches that there were to stop and searches in the previous legacy forces and how that was then, uh, some of that was then taken into uh, at Police at Scotland, but I think the code will put us into a much better place uh, and giving us greater clarity in a way which we haven't had historically, uh, and will give uh, the committee um, and others a much clearer insight into exactly how Police Scotland are using stop and search uh, and when they're using stop and search, and also to make sure that uh, the police are using it as a, an effective tool uh, in order to prevent and to, uh, to tackle crime, because it is an effective tool as mm -hmm. and when it's used appropriately, um, and the code aims to support and assisting the police in being able to do that. And I mean, I think that the point you make about it being an effective tool, I think, is something that's often lost in the, in the, in the wider debate about how it's been used in the past. But given the dramatic fall we've seen, um, in a sense, the, the, the removal of the, the, of the consensual stop and search as an option, but actually the, the significant drop in, in uh, stop and search overall, there isn't any evidence at, at this stage that um, policing has been less effective either in the generality or in particular areas as a result in, in that reduction in, in the use of that tactic in particular? It, no, there isn't any evidence. I know that there have, uh, there have been uh, suggestions that um, uh, the loss of consensual stop and search could result in uh, particular types of crime increasing. So in particular, uh, there's been reference made to the possibility of an increase in uh, knife crime. Uh, from the evidence that uh, we have considered the evidence that the uh, advisory group have considered. Um, uh, there is no evidence that provides a correlation between the two. Um, uh, it's also worth keeping in mind is that uh, uh, stop and search in uh, uh, England and Wales has been in a statutory footing for almost 30 years now. Mm. Uh, and there were issues around how stop and search was being used within the Metropolitan Police Division. And at that time, they looked at the issue of whether there was a correlation between uh, some forms of violent crime that were taking place and uh, stop and search. And the Home Office came up with the same uh, view, is that there is no evidence that actually links the two. So, you know, uh, does a greater level of stop and search uh, result in uh, a reduction in these crimes, or does it uh, a reduction in stop and search result in an increase in particular types of crime? Uh, and there is no evidence to support a correlation between the, the two. Having said that, I think it's an area we need to keep under very careful review. Uh, we need to continue to monitor that. If there is any new and emerging evidence that uh, would suggest there are issues that need to be considered uh, in the way in which uh, stop and search uh, is used, in the way in which it's applied uh, by the police then, I think it's responsible uh, 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 for it's a responsibility for us all to make sure that we consider that. And, that's why the code has been drafted in such a way as it will allow us to revisit it at any point in the future, uh, as and when there is any new evidence that would suggest we need to change it or we need to alter it. And I think it's also incumbent on the police that if they uh, believe that they require powers for particular purposes, that there should be uh, evidence to support a justification for that, uh, so that uh, uh, powers which we provide to the police are based upon uh, clear evidence that can demonstrate that they uh, will have a beneficial effect in keeping our communities safe and in preventing crime. Um, and on this particular issue around uh, consensual stop and search, there hasn't been any evidence uh, that I'm aware of and that the advisory group were aware of that demonstrated that. And I think actually in the evidence which the subcommittee received as well, I think there was, although there were those who were putting the proposition, they felt that it, that it potentially could really lead to an increase in some types of crime, they accepted that there was a lack of evidence uh, to actually support that proposition at this particular point. Mm. Okay. Okay. John Finney, followed by Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Convener. Hey, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, I don't think anyone would dispute that stop and search is an important tool um, in the, the police armoury, but only if it used appropriately, and to my mind appropriately, would be used very sparingly. Um, both the impact assessment and the consultation highlighted the need, uh, quote, for an easy to understand guide to the code aimed at members of the public. And I think it's important that we have informed citizens, particularly young people. Could you advise um, how the Scottish Government, um, and I'm aware that you're going to post the, uh, a, these guides on your website, but it, you'll understand it not necessarily be a first port of call for young people, how that information will be got out so that people fully understand their rights, but also their responsibilities? Well, you're correct. It will be placed <coughs> on uh, line for individuals to access. It will also be made available at all police stations as well. We're also working just now with the, um, with the advisory group to produce a, a plain English version uh, of it, uh, which will be uh, available uh, to members of the public. Uh, but the member who I know has a, a long-standing interest in this issue as well, as is Mr MacArthur, is that, um, and the particular impact it had on young people and children, is that we're also uh, uh, working to develop a, uh, a children and young people's uh, guide to stop and search as well, which would be appropriate to, uh, to that particular age group. So uh, a combination of having it available online, having it available in police stations, uh, but also producing a plain English version of it and also a children and young people's version of it as well to try and help to support individuals in understanding what the rights are and how stop and search should be applied. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Douglas Rona, then me. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the Code of Conduct removes uh, some options that the police have previously had. It puts it on a formal basis. Um, I just wonder if the Minister can confirm that notwithstanding the existence of the Code of Practice and the essentially restrictions it can replace, place, that police uh, can address overriding issues of safety and do whatever is necessary to preserve uh, life in the circumstances in which they find themselves? Well, there, uh, was, a, there was an issue of concern that uh, part of the code, uh, section three of the code and uh, section 3.3 3, 3 of the code around how that would be applied in instances where officers in a private place may be dealing with someone who they felt there was a threat to their life, uh, someone who was potentially suicidal, and whether they yeah. would be able to uh, search that individual to uh, check to see if they had any items uh, which were a matter of concern uh, that could result in them harming themselves. Um, uh, following the uh, consultation on the draft code, um, at 3.4 was introduced uh, by the advisory group, which uh, in effect uh, gives the police that additional comfort that in uh, reminding them that they have that overall responsibility to uh, the duty to protect life. Uh, and that in an instance like that, they would have the ability to be able to search that individual to see if they had any items on them that could uh, cause them harm. I think during the evidence as well that the subcommittee received, John Scott explained that a combination of what's been provided within the uh, code to address the concern which was there. And I think um, uh, it'd be fair to say, I think uh, Police Scotland are also comforted by that provision within the uh, code. But if you also keep in mind within the uh, Police and Fire Reform at Scotland Act, the, there is that explicit responsibility on constables to, uh, <coughs> to protect uh, life. When that's read alongside uh, ECHR uh, and the need to preserve life under Article 2, um, both of them give comfort to the fact that, from a legislative point of view, there is legislation there that would support the police in acting in that way in a private place, someone who they thought was at risk, uh, that uh, particularly if they were at risk of suicide, who may have something on them that could uh, cause harm to them, to be able to have the power to be able to search them in doing so. Uh, so that was an issue that was picked up during the, co the course of the consultation exercise. And what we'll do in going forward is we'll continue to monitor how that's being applied. And uh, uh, Police Scotland feels though that gives them enough comfort uh, as it stands at the present time. But if there's a need for us to look at any further legislative changes going forward uh, to address that, then we can consider that in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Douglas Ross. 
Just to follow on that point from Mr Stevenson, at the moment you have got no uh, intentions to legislate for that element? No, we have got no specific intentions to it at the present time. And so what is the, the time scales will you allow for this? Is it just if Police Scotland come back to you at any point? Will you review it in six months, a year? I know the, um, the um, Dr Scott's group are reviewing it at intervals. Uh, will it be on recommendation, further recommendation from him? Because he has included in his ev evidence to the subcommittee that he believes that a legislative solution may be required. Is it his evidence? Is it Police Scotland's evidence? How would you view um, the competing demands so it'll be over, in this area. So it'll be over the course of the next year, when we're reviewing how the code has been implemented, so there'll be the six-month interim review, and then there'll be the complete review at the end of the year. Uh, if there is a, a following on from what we have in the code at the present time, if there's a feeling from Police Scotland and advisory group that we should bring forward some form of legislative change, then we'll look for an opportunity going forward to do that. So once we've completed the first few, full year, will then be in a better place to make a decision on that. Can I ask your um, response to the comments by Callum Steele uh, <coughs> on behalf of the Scottish Ple Police Federation? It was Liam MacArthur uh, started off asking about uh, some of these issues, but his specific points about the bureaucracy might turn some officers away from using these powers. I'm not entirely sure whether that will be the case. I'm. Uh, I think there is a, a need to make sure that we have in place a, a system that is robust and effective, that allows effective recording of the use of stop and search, that the uh, balance between preserving the rights of the public around stop and search and the need for the police to effectively record that are important. And I think in the evidence that was provided by Police Scotland, ACC, Williams was quite clear. He felt that any additional bureaucracy that goes alongside this is actually balanced out by the public trust and the public confidence that comes from having a code in place. So they're trying to get that balance, uh, that balance right. And I think the code, by and large, achieves that. If over the course of the six months to a year, once the code has been applied, if there are issues being highlighted that are a particular problem to Police Scotland, that allows us the opportunity to revisit that. But um, Police Scotland have been very heavily engaged in this whole process to make sure we try and get it as right as possible. And I think any um, small amount of additional bureaucracy that's attached to the application of the code, I think is outweighed by the benefits we get from public trust and public assurance around how stop and search has been used by the police. So do you think Callum Steele's incorrect in his assumptions? No, I just don't agree with his particular view on this. I think the, the code gets it broadly quite probably right, and I think over the course of the year we'll be able to monitor that. And finally, can I ask, do you anticipate any areas in Scotland where the number of stop and searches will increase as a result of this? Uh, not at the present time. Do you not think there is a possibility that in some areas that didn't take the approach that the former Strathclyde area took, uh, and they resisted some of the demands under the, the previous uh, leadership of Police Scotland, that now with the extra training that some officers who were not particularly um, used to doing uh, stop and search under the old um, procedures with new training, um, new, you know, new awareness amongst officers in certain parts of Scotland, actually we will see for a period uh, a spike in the number of stop and searches. No, not necessarily. Uh, the reason being is because the significant increase that we had in some areas was because of the use of consensual stop and search, uh, which the code will bring an end to. So all stop and search will have to be conducted on a statutory basis. So what will happen will be, is that as a part of the code, is that the data for local command areas will go to local commanders on how stop and search has been used at a localised level. They'll be able to consider that to make sure that it's appropriate and it's in compliance with the code, and that will then be applied at a national level. So I think if, if, um, if you look back at the history of this issue, the, the big numbers around uh, stop and search were to do with consensual stop and search, uh, not statutory-based stop and search. Yep. I, I put that same question to Dr Scott, and I would uh, reiterate what you said. I think the work he and the advisory group have done has been excellent and also I welcome the, the opportunity he gave for party <coughs> spokespersons to, to meet with him and discuss it. But he did accept that there could be some parts of Scotland which previously hadn't really used stop and search powers at all. They hadn't really gone down the route uh, that 
could be seen in the west of Scotland, central Scotland, etc., could now, with this new training coming in, officers go along to a training session, get this information about stop and search, and then go out and use it um, more readily. So he did accept that that could happen, but you're suggesting it won't. Well, I think we'll find out over the course of the next year. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that it will, because statutory stop and search has always been there. So unless there's a, a change in tactics, which are the way in which it's been used within a local command area, the, we're not providing any additional powers here. So it's always a provision which has been there. Police officers are trained in the use of statutory stop and search. What we're doing is that the training which officers are now going through is because of the application of the new code. So to make sure they're familiar with that. So any officer who's gone through their training would have been trained in the use of stop and search, both in a consensual and in a non-consensual basis. Rona Mackay, followed by Mary Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I was encouraged by the evidence from the Children's Commissioner um, who said that the early consultation had been with children and young people had been particularly uh, useful and helpful. And I'm also encouraged by the fact that you're producing a children and young people's guide. I just wanted to ask if you're content that the, uh, the issue around children, the child protection issue is robust within the code? Well, there was a, a very... <coughs> significant and concerted attempt to make sure that we capture the views of young people around the use of uh, stop and search, given that there had been such a uh, significant level of concern about the way in which consensual stop and search was being used with uh, young people. Uh, and um, uh, in fairness, it's a, a credit to my officials in the way in which they've taken forward this work and in making sure that young people were fully involved in this process. I'm content that the code gets the balance right and that we've been able to make sure that the views and issues of young people have fed into the process in shaping it. And as you'll be aware, the code has a specific part to deal with uh, it, children. What we need to do is just to monitor that going forward and to make sure that that balance is the right one. Uh, if there are any issues of concern or areas where we can improve it, that we uh, address those going forward. And I think it's reasonable to say that over the next year, the next six months to a year as we review, we'll be able to identify whether there's any further uh, work that needs to be undertaken. But once the code is introduced, the level of clarity we'll have in these issues is way beyond anything we have ever had before when it comes to stop and search and the way in which it will be applied to uh, children and young people. Uh, so um, I'm confident that We'll have much greater clarity and understanding of that and also we'll have much clearer data around the use of uh, uh, the use of stop and search. Uh, you'll be aware that one of the issues that was raised uh, during the course of the uh, consultation exercise is whether there was a legislative gap around being able to uh, search young people for uh, alcohol uh, and uh, I was open-minded uh, on the issue about whether there was a legislative gap that needed to be closed to give the police a specific search power to be able to search young people for um, alcohol. In considering that, the advisory group have uh, not been able to come up with evidence and data that would support the provision of such a specific uh, piece of uh, statutory power that should be given to uh, the police. But what we have said is that we will uh, review that over the next year. So the, uh, over the next year, Police Scotland will be collating data specifically on this matter um, and they will then share that information with the advisory group, which will then provide an interim report to myself uh, at six months and then uh, a report after a year. And if after that period of time there is evidence that demonstrates that there is a gap, then it's an issue that we can consider and look at then. But if there is no evidence to support uh, uh, the need for any further statutory powers in that area, uh, then uh, it be, uh, I don't think it would be justified for us to then look at providing a particular statutory power when there is no evidence to actually support the need for it. Okay, thank you. Mary Fee? Um, thank you. I wanted to ask you for a bit more detail around <coughs> the, the, the review and assessment um, process. Um, I, I think the, the new chapters that have been included in, in the guide, Chapter 7, where a, a child is involved, are particularly welcome. And Pauline McIntyre um, 
was, was very pleased to see the, the new things included in that chapter. And chapter eight on um, vulnerable people is also very welcome. And I'm thinking specifically around um, adults with, with mental health. I think it's a huge improvement in the code to see that, that new chapter there. But I just wondered, in the interim in, uh, review in six months, uh, until a, a code is actually used, you won't know how how good it is and if it is actually working effectively. So thinking specifically about the new chapters seven and eight, at the six months review, will we be able to drill down sufficiently to see that the new chapters, the new guidelines are working effectively? And if you find any, any gaps or any concerns raised, will you be able at that point to change them or will you have to wait for, a, for the year to be up? Well, I think... It my only note of caution here is that I think six months may be too early mm. to actually give us a, a true understanding mm. of a, a, a how the code is operating overall. The reason that um, I've asked for a six-month interim report is that if there are some trends emerging, it will allow us to then look at whether we need to do some further work over the coming six months mm. to understand that information more fully, so that by the time we get to the end of a year, uh, we can actually supplement any information that's gathered over the course of that year by Police Scotland with any other additional work that we might want to do during that period if trends are emerging. So what I would say to you is that if it's six months, uh, there are issues around um, uh, uh, how it's being applied to individuals who are vulnerable, uh, whether it be someone with a learning disability, someone with mental illness, um, uh, that we need to consider at that point, it would allow us to then look at whether we need to do anything further to understand that mm. more fully, so that hopefully by the time we get to the end of a year, we'll be in a better place in understanding the full extent and the nature of mm -hmm. the issue. So um, I think a year is probably a reasonable time frame for us to give us a, mm. that broader understanding, but that's a six months almost health check mm -hmm. will allow us to then identify whether there's any emerging trends. And in these areas, if there are emerging trends, whether we need to do a bit further work to understand that more fully so that we can then look at the issue in the overall review after a year. That's helpful. Thank you. I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, the, the code is very much welcomed and um, has been well thought out. And I think everyone's very relieved that there will be a review and it will be monitored as it goes along. If you could comment on some of the the reports in the press about the, the cost of implementing the training, etc., which was, um, I think, monitored or muted at three, three million at a time when press, uh, when the police budgets are, are under quite a bit of pressure. Well, the, the, uh, the, figures, uh, the figures are nothing new in that. The figures are part of the BRIA, uh, which went alongside uh, the drafting of the code. So it's already information which uh, we've provided and calculated. The, way in which it's been managed is through the ongoing training provision for officers through Police Scotland so, uh, and their uh, ongoing training of uh, constables. So the, uh, the information is, uh, uh, is information which we'd calculated on the basis of some of the IT changes that had to be made and also some of the, information, some of the work around uh, training of uh, officers and it's been absorbed into the ongoing training programme for police officers. Okay, thank you. Lee McCarthy. I was going to ask you about the, um, the, the, the separate powers in relation to stop and search uh, around, uh, around alcohol, but I think you've probably given as much of an answer to that as you, as you can. <coughs> but following up um, Douglas's earlier line of questioning about the potential for an increase in, in use of stop and search um, uh, in areas where it's historically been lower, I mean, I quoted the figures previously of a reduction of 99.5% in, in consensual stop and search and, and an overall reduction in 93 and a, and a bit percent of stop and search as, as a whole. What, what has been the, the figure for um, the, uh, the, the use of statutory stop and search over that period? Because as you say, consensual stop and search made up the, the vast bulk of, of, um, uh, of the figures up until that point. I don't have those figures to hand, but I can get you the most up-to-date figures if that would be helpful. I mean, even just the use of statutory stop and search. I mean, that would be helpful. But I mean, even just in terms of the the, the trend that we've seen over that 12-month period. I mean, has it remained um, largely kind of static, and, and it, it, that that 93.5 percent is just made up um, uh, sort of principally by the the, the, the 
the, the, the numbers of consensual stop and search kind yeah. of falling off a cliff? Um, or has there been a reduction in, in statutory stop and search as well over that period? Um, I think in the, on the issue of consensual stop and search, I think the more uh, up-to-date figures will show that it's declined even further. Right. Um, and this is all in preparation to the code coming in, um, where consensual stop and search will no longer uh, be used. But in terms of the overall figure, the most up-to-date figure on the use of statutory stop and search, I can come back to you with the, uh, with uh, accurate details on that um, uh, from Police Scotland and where their figures are at at the present time. Right. I mean, I think also the, the point you were making in relation to um, the additional bureaucracy, and Douglas quite rightly um, highlighted the concerns that Callum Steele was raising, but I think ACC Williams, as well as, as talking about um, the increased in public confidence and, and transparency, I think made a, made a point of saying that actually in, in the interests of police officers themselves, that transparency very often provided them um, some protection from allegations of, of inappropriate, um, inappropriate use. So in a sense, the, the, the benefit wasn't simply um, to do with public confidence and, and, and the relationship between the public and police officers, but to some extent was actually pre presenting additional protection to police officers and the way in which they were using it was, was far more transparent and therefore the, the opportunity for allegations to be made um, a, a about misuse were much reduced. Is that something, that, again, that you would, you would recognise? Yeah, I do. And, and you can see from the evidence which you received from ACC Williams in response to the issue that Douglas Ross had uh, raised, and that was about the way in which you know, stop and search is just one way for officers to gather intelligence uh, on a particular issue. There's a, uh, 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 there's a range of ways in which officers can actually gather information and uh, intelligence. I think uh, the point that, uh, that, that uh, ACC Williams was uh, also keen to impress on was the uh, need to make sure that uh, stop and search was being used in a legitimate, accountable way. Uh, that the public could have uh, uh, confidence in. And I think it's important that uh, our responsibility uh, uh, in government and parliament is to set that framework within which the police can operate and to give the uh, police clarity around what their uh, role is and how they uh, should fulfil their duties as well, so that uh, we're doing everything possible to support them in the very important and the very good job that they do uh, for us. So I think uh, some of the amendments that have been made to the code at a draft stage are reflections of the views that have been expressed by constables in saying, look, we need greater clarity around some of these matters, particularly the point around being able to search someone who may be in a, a, a vulnerable individual who may uh, uh, be at risk of committing suicide. So to provide them with that additional assurance and that additional uh, uh, clarity. So I think it helps them in having an understanding of what the rules are and how it should be applied um, in a way that previously has not been there. Uh, and some of the historical issues that you raised earlier on around the collection of data and the reliability of that data, I think, reflects a considerable level of uh, different interpretations on uh, uh, how it should be applied and when it should be used and how it should then be recorded. Uh, what the code will do is it will remove all of that uncertainty. So it will provide the police with clarity, but it also provides the public with clarity mm. uh, and ensures that it's been taken forward in a way which is, uh, I think is, uh, ensures legitimacy of its use as a, a valuable tool as and when it's necessary, uh, but also there's appropriate accountability uh, around how it's being used, given the very invasive nature that stop and search is, because it's, a, it's, an, it's an invasive... Uh, tactic um, uh, which uh, invades an individual's personal privacy uh, and uh, we need to make sure we get those checks and balances right and I think the code uh, by and large uh, probably gets that balance right but we'll be able to make sure we continue to assess that over the, the next year. Just more broadly I mean I think we've all accepted um, that the, the, the place we're at now in terms of the code of practice is, is, is very welcome and um, I think it's also acknowledged we've come a long distance uh, from the point where my colleague Alison McInnes and, and to be fair John Finney were, were raising this um, routinely in, in committee in, in Parliament. Has this prompted the government to look at other areas where almost established practice may need a bit of um, a bit of challenge function um, exerted? I mean, I, I appreciate that that's the role of um, uh, ourselves as, as uh, members of this committee, but uh, have, have the government 
sort of asked Police Scotland to, to look at other areas of, of, um, of the tactics that they use, the approach that they, they use in carrying out their duties that... that uh, a little bit, but it's up to the Cabinet Secretary if you want to re respond to that. Well, look, I think it would be fair to say that, you know, I, I established an advisory group recognising the concerns that there were about the use of stop and search, and mm. I had concerns when I became Cabinet Secretary about the data and the quality of the data and uh, uh, the uh, information which was available to us and understanding how it was being used and the way in which it was being used as well. And there is a, a danger that um, if, uh, if a, an appropriate tactic is used uh, incorrectly or inappropriately, it can undermine public confidence in the validity of its use. Uh, and I think the Code of Practice helps to give us that level of assurance and will help to support public confidence in how it's being applied. In, in that way, as I mentioned earlier on, I think it uh, helps to give the police legitimacy and accountability around how it's being used, but also public confidence in uh, the way in which it will be used and the rights individuals have and how it's being applied. On some of the broader issues um, around it, I'm always conscious that there is, uh, it's important that the police are able to use a, a range of uh, uh, tactics and approaches which can help to uh, help to make our communities as safe as uh, possible. So, for example, one of the areas which I know the member has an interest in is around the use of biometrics. The uh, use of biometrics is growing uh, considerably and its application within uh, uh, tackling uh, crime is an important element of I, well, I think it will be an important element of uh, how we meet some of the challenges around new and emerging uh, crime going uh, forward. As that develops, I think it's important that we have appropriate safeguards in there and how biometrics are going to be used and the uh, way in which they will be used and what the, uh, uh, what the, uh, what the oversight role will be uh, uh, with the police and how uh, biometrics are being used. So, that's an area which I know HMICS has raised, which I welcomed at the time, and it's an issue which I'm giving a considerable amount of consideration to at the present time. Uh, and the reason why I think it's important to address that is not because I don't want the police to be able to use these things. I want them to be able to use them, but to have a structure in place that actually provides accountability, uh, legitimacy, and also can give public assurance around how they're being applied. And as that whole area develops, I think it's important we make sure that we support the police and be able to uh, use these things appropriately and legitimately as and when it's necessary. And one of the most effective ways I believe we can do that is by providing the right type of oversight uh, structures that can uh, give us that level of uh, public reassurance and accountability. So, um, so that may be an example of where I think uh, from government's perspective is trying to help to support the police, but to do so in a way that also uh, uh, it gives the public confidence in how they're going about using these types of new and emerging technologies as we go forward. John Finney. Yeah, I just wanted Cabinet Secretary to pick on something uh, my colleague Ray MacArthur said there, and I, I, I'm paraphrasing, or one interpretation of what he said could be that this code is righting some historic wrong. The reality is that there are common law powers of search, there have been uh, statutory powers of search in relation to drugs, in relation to offensive mm -hmm. weapons, firearms, which were applied without incident, largely without incident, for decades on end. The legislation goes back over half a century. The aberration was this so-called nonsense of consensual search, which this now addresses. So rather than bringing some brave new world, it's reinforcing something that was being properly operated in the past. Would you agree with that characterisation? Well, I, I agree with that, and it, because there is there's a whole range of different statutory, not statutes that provide uh, search powers uh, in different situations. And of course, uh, this only deals with search powers when it comes to individuals who have not been arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, there are then obviously search powers uh, which are dealt with under standard operating procedures within the police uh, for anyone who has been uh, uh, arrested. So. Um, my view, it, it gets into a much better place and provides much greater clarity around these matters, both for officers and also for the public. Uh, and it allows Parliament to have oversight on how, uh, what the rules are and how it should be applied. It will also uh, uh, provide us with greater data so that we can see much more transparency around this matter. And if Parliament is minded at some point in the future to look at amending and changing the code, uh, then Parliament will be 
uh, the body will decide on whether there should be any amendments or changes which the government might bring forward at some point if that's necessary. So um, I think it gets us to a much better place and uh, it gives Parliament a much clearer role in setting down that framework for what is uh, you know, one of our most important public uh, services uh, in the country, the police, but also balancing that against the rights of individuals to go about their daily life. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to make any closing remarks, Government Secretary? No. No. Okay. The third item on the agenda is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The motion is motion 03459 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Stop and Search Code of Practice Appointed Days Scotland Regulations 2017 draft be approved. Can I invite the Minister to speak and move to the motion? Moved. Fine. Um, I put the question then, are there any questions from members? Everyone satisfied? I think we've had uh, a good session on that already. Um, I put the question, therefore, that uh, the motion 0349, in the name of Michael Matheson, be approved. Are we all agreed? Great. Great. We are all agreed. That includes, concludes consideration of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Our members contend to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft report. Great. Thank you for that. I now suspend to allow the minister and his officials to leave. Thank you. We have on the agenda today is consideration of a negative SSI. This is the Title Condition Scotland Act 2003 Rural Housing Bodies Amendment Order 2017 SSI 2017 Oblique 7. I refer members to Paper 2. Do members have any comments? No comments. Okay. Then, is the committee agreed that does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Our next uh, agenda item is feedback from the convener of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 12th January 2017. This will be a verbal report and I refer members to paper three and invite Mary Fee to provide that feedback, after which there will be an opportunity for any comments or questions. Mary. Thank you, um, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met last week to agree its findings on the draft Stop and Search Code of Practice and its forward work programme. And the letter outlining the subcommittee's views is included in the paper as well as an updated work programme. And I'm happy to um, answer any questions or any, appreciate any comments that anyone may have. Any comments on the, the report? No. If not, then we move to the next item, which is private session. The next committee meeting will be on the 21st of February, when we'll take evidence on the limitation Child Abuse Scotland Bill and consider our draft report on the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Se uh, Inquiry. The next item on...